Uh, it's great to be here with you all. Um, can we just do a mic check? Can you all hear me well? Give me a thumbs up, type something in the chat, turn on your video and smile, however you want to react to that. Great, great, great. I'll give a little bit of, um, of a disclaimer. Um, I, I'm currently based in um, northern Tanzania, uh, not far from the site of what is proposed to be the longest heated crude oil pipeline in the world. And uh, the internet here is quite bad. Uh, this week, we have had um, issues with attacks on our internet, and we've also uh, had a conference come in. So it's quite an overloaded um, you know, bandwidth at the moment. But uh, what's working to our advantage is that it's uh, 9 PM. So you know, the, the sort of high peak of time uh, for internet use during the day has passed. So I hope that gives us enough, enough space for um, continuity. I'll just ask uh, Lisa and uh, other something. Feel free to pick up the momentum. Feel free to raise a conversation uh, to, to keep everything going. Um, you know, we're all teachers and we're all students. We're all here to learn together. We're all here to build our power together. We're all, we're all here to save our species and others. Um, so, you know, we are in this together. Um, and that often means, you know, <laughs> working with the infrastructure that we have. Um, as we all know, it might, it might even get worse with time. Um, so it's good practice, you know, now while we, while we still have some. Um, so my name is Phil, and um, I'm from Susquehannock, uh, which is um, known today as Pennsylvania. Um, and I, I, I've lived in East Africa for the past 13 years, uh, working closely with a number of uh, social and political movements and struggles across um, mostly Sub-Saharan Africa, but elsewhere in the world as well. Um, and in the past several years, maybe three, four years, I've been more and more um, involved in uh, the climate justice struggle. Uh, before that, I was involved quite heavily in a, in a, in a, in a network called uh, the National Land Defense League uh, of Uganda. Um, and I can talk a little bit about that experience, but uh, what's important to me is to hear from you what uh, you all would um, most benefit from in this uh, two hours that we have together. So if we take the full two hours, um, I, I would really like to know that we've covered, you know, 70 or 80 percent of of the ground that you would like to cover together. So I want to structure this session uh, based on a few questions that I have for you all. Um, so we're sort of working together here to build this session. Feeling today that I would like to um, understand the broader 350 network a little bit better and it would be um, you know, personally edifying and educational for me to, to, uh, to, to at least get some time to hear from you all, what, what challenges you're facing, um, what you'd like to discuss. I say too much or share too much about myself. I have a few questions and you can answer them in the chat. Um, the, I'll, I'll try to make them as easy to answer as possible. Um, uh, so my first question is, um, I'd like to get a sense of your level of experience in organizing. Um, so uh, let's rate ourselves on a scale of one to five. How much experience do you have in organizing? So one would be you're quite new to organizing. You've never really done it before. You know that uh, you're a human being that can cooperate with other human beings and you're ready to learn. You're ready to put yourself to the test, but you haven't really done it yet. And then five would be, you know, you've been, you can do this in your sleep. You've been organizing um, people across all kinds of issues and all kinds of contexts for a long time. Um, and you're quite, you know, experienced. Um, so just uh, rank your yourself uh, on a scale of one to five. Just drop that number in the chat. Welcome, Katya. Beautiful. Welcome. Jeffrey, you as well, Austin, welcome, welcome. Puja, welcome. Okay. Yes, yes, we can cooperate, Mercy. We can do it. Okay, Silas, welcome. 
George. Have we heard from everyone? So I think we've heard from at least most of us. Um, and it sounds like there are a lot of newcomers. So really, you're welcome to the table. And one of the key principles of organizing is that you have to create many points of entry. You want people to be able to find you and get involved. And you know, so many movements sort of um, live this long, drawn out life. And they don't really evolve and build power because people are with the same people over and over. So you know, uh, organizing people is all about inviting people in, you know, that welcoming, that hospitality, that, uh, you know, creating a sense of belonging. There's so much to say about all these things and more, but um, uh, I'm glad that you found 350 or the respective, you know, movements and members and, and uh, groups that you're with around the world. This is really good. I can see folks um, from South Dakota, from Fiji, from Sioux Falls, wonderful. Great, so um, my next question for you is, um, have any of you attended a session uh, convergence or meeting uh, where you learned about organizing from any East African organizer, where any East African organizer has facilitated a session? So if you haven't, you can just type no into the chat. And if you have, um, let us know if you remember anything from that session, maybe who facilitated it or any of the groups represented. Okay, I see a lot of no's. I just don't want to repeat something that many people have already heard. So if there are a lot of no's, that gives me the green light to be able to share with you all um, some stories, you know, some, some, some stories uh, and learnings that I've I've been able to accumulate over these few years. Okay, so the next question I need to give a little bit of a background to. So um, when we talk about changing the world, um, there are many ways to do it. And uh, there is a sort of um, leftist sociologist um, called Eric Allen Wright that died a few years ago. And he had this uh, book called Envisioning Real Utopias. And in this book, um, he talked about three fundamental ways to make change. Um, and we're not gonna do a lot of like flashy tricks with like uh, facilitation here. This is gonna be mostly a conversation between us, very informal. Um, we might use breakout rooms if we decide that that's you know useful, but uh, um, you know I'm not gonna be showing a lot of you know big theoretical models or anything like that. Uh, so this is uh, this might be the only image that I share in this entire two hour session, but uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Can you all see a triple Venn diagram on your zoom screens. Oops. Great I see Austin's thumbs up so mercy, thank you. Um, so essentially Eric Allen Wright had uh, this idea that change can be categorized or transformation of, of the world can be categorized in three different ways. And uh, the language is a little bit dense, but uh, we'll, we'll kind of uh, dig into it as we go. So um, in this first, this top um, uh, circle in this, in this Venn diagram, let's look at something that he calls ruptural change. So what he means by ruptural change is change that destroys the system, dismantles the system, attacks the system, whether capitalism or authoritarianism or patriarchy, uh, change that is disruptive and um, you know, presents a threat against the status quo and against the system. So he calls that ruptural change. We can think of it, um, uh, as something that's kind of revolutionary, something that's very powerful. So if you've ever heard the term civil disobedience or the term direct action, or you've participated in uh, civil disobedience or direct action, very likely these are some of the things that Wright, the sociologist Wright was uh, talking about when he talked about ruptural change. So that's our top um, circle in this uh, uh, Venn diagram. And then on this bottom left circle, um, he describes something called interstitial transformation. And what he means by interstitial transformation is change outside of the system, change parallel to the system. 
So if you develop, you know, an alternative language, if you develop an alternative economy, um, a new currency, you know, that's only respected within your particular area, if you uh, decide to do agroecology in a different way that's different from industrial farming, right? These are examples of um, creating the world, the utopian vision that you want to see outside of the system. You're not relying on the system to do it. You're creating it outside of and parallel to the system. So he calls that interstitial change. So we have ruptural change on the top, interstitial change on the bottom left. And then on the bottom right um, is the third uh, circle, which we call symbiotic transformation or symbiotic change. Um, and symbiotic change basically means how do we use the levers of the system to change the system or to get the change that we want. So these would be things like advocacy, lobbying, uh, often even pr some protests like symbolic protests can fall within this category. A lot of NGO work falls into this category, nonprofit work falls into this category. Uh, work that's, you know, doing advocacy, uh, trying to work with state budgets, you know, trying to negotiate with the private sector these kind of things, uh, using the lever of the system to, to, to make the change that you want. Um, so just to recap, because I know this is, you know, it's quite, it's quite dense and I'm going through it fast. So uh, we have ruptural change, which uh, is change against the system. It damages the system. We have interstitial change. That is a change parallel to or outside of the system. And then we have symbiotic change, change within the system or using the system. Um, and so these are, uh, you know, uh, some of these uh, ways of creating change can work together. And that's why it's a, that's why I'm just kind of pointing to the simple Venn diagram is because there can be some overlap, yeah? Uh, you can be engaged in, for example, one of the famous actions um, from, I believe, uh, the central United States was uh, a solar farm that was built on the proposed uh, pipeline path. Um, so they were simultaneously using ruptural action by blockading and building physical in infrastructure in the way of um, a fossil fuel pipeline. And then they were also prefiguring or envisioning the world that they wanted to have by uh, you know, showing that solar could be a, a viable you know, renewable energy compared to more dirty uh, energies. Um, so, you know, they were sort of doing both at the same time. They were doing ruptural uh, disruptive change while also uh, that interstitial change. Um, and, you know, similarly, uh, many of us are engaged in both advocacy and disruption. You know, so we might be somewhere in between symbiotic and ruptural. Um, not all of us do everything. Um, and not everything is the, the appropriate thing to do at all times, right? So there's some strategy built into this that we can get into later. But I would like to know from you. So all of this is, you know, uh, deep background to my, to my question that I want to ask you all. Where do you find yourselves in, um, uh, let me stop sharing my screen to make things easier for myself. Where do you find yourselves um, in this Venn diagram? Um, so you can, uh, you can just let us know in the chat. Are you mostly ruptural? Uh, are you mostly uh, engaged in symbiotic means like, uh, like advocacy? Do you do maybe just a little bit of interstitial change as well? How, how would you situate yourself in that Venn diagram? So feel free to give us a sentence in the chat that explains uh, where, you would, where you would find yourself. Um, and it, it, I know it feels a bit abstract. If there are any questions, just feel free to unmute yourself. You don't need to raise your hand. Just uh, just interrupt me and 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 ask any questions if it's not clear. Kara says mostly symbiotic and traditional advocacy. Jeffrey says symbiotic with shades of interstitial. So leaning a little bit towards sym symbiotic, but not exclusively.
So two responses from Karen, Jeffrey, anybody else? Silas, thank you. Symbiotic and interstitial. Thanks for that thorough response, Pooja. Symbiotic mostly. There's a there's a question uh, as we get more of your responses coming in. Uh, Pooja also asked about strikes. So any particular tactic might fall more than one place. Um, strikes, uh, yeah, I think you could make an argument that strikes um, can be symbiotic. It depends on the type of strike, the context in which it's uh, carried out. Um, you can you can also do you know a general strike where all sh all small business really shuts down you know tax revenue collection and, and everything across the city, uh, and that's more ruptural. Maybe like a worker a worker strike you know formally called by a worker union might be more symbiotic, but it's also a little bit ruptural, right? And it can also be interstitial. You know, instead of striking, we're going to get together and cook dinner. You know, we're going to um, uh, throw a party inside the factory or inside the school. Or, um great examples uh, around the world about different kinds of strikes and it's one of the most uh, thoroughly uh, uh researched and and discussed tactics when it comes to to resistance the enigma i like that name symbiotic mostly a lot of symbiotic advocacy kind of uh, responses traditional advocacy great so, um, and then I'll, I didn't plan on asking this question, but I'm just curious because there are so many, um, so many of you saying that you fall somewhere between, you know, interstitial and symbiotic, maybe leaning towards symbiotic. Um, uh, let me ask about like the, the, the environment, the democratic conditions, the, the, the openness, the open space and, and rights that you have in your respective contexts. If you're to um, rank them on a scale of one to five, five being, you know, you have all kinds of, you know, uh, politicians that really listen to you and have like really amazing values and, um, you know, your movement is well protected in, in your home and encouraged and um, the system is supporting you. And then one being, you know, you live maybe in a very authoritarian dictatorship or where um, companies have private companies have all the power and steal all the land and your rights are suppressed and police are always after you uh just just uh, give me a sense of our the kind of conditions that uh that we're each working with in this zoom room so one would be you know really bad conditions and then five would be really great conditions Three, three to four. <laughs> Very specific, Silas. Mm. Thanks for that response, Pooja. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we have varying contexts. Um, so symbiotic, you know, transformation uh, tends to work better where there are there are better conditions uh, for advocacy, um, where the system is ready to listen and kind of act on what's being brought forth. Okay, great. This gives me a bit of a sense of the folks that we have in the room, um, a general sense of 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 we as a small temporary collective here. Um, so I'd like to actually give us each a chance to share, you know, just uh, 60 to 90 seconds, each of us. Um, I'll call on your name, and uh, I would love to hear from you about uh, what you're, where you're calling from in the world, if you haven't shared that with us already. Um, any, you know, details you might want to share regarding your name and, and uh, titles and pronouns and so on and so forth, if you haven't shared those yet. Uh, but just, you know, a quick 
one paragraph description about um, what you're working on in terms of uh, the climate justice struggle, um, just to get a sense of who we have here together. Um, are we ready to do this? Uh, can I start with the enigma? Because I'm so curious already, the mysteria, you know, is drawing me in. The enigma, can you? Um, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, <clears throat> the enigma here, this is uh, from Kenya. Um, mostly, uh, I'm doing advo social advocacy in um, uh, governance processes that is largely budget advocacy, human rights, and um, several other things, uh, mostly on climate action and climate change issues. Um, I'm looking at it from um, the angle of advocating for uh, more budgetary allocations for uh, you know, tree planting activities, uh, conservation of uh, forests and uh, such kind of activities. I think that's uh, <laughs> that's enough of what you yeah. requested. Oh, Definitely, that's enough. And uh, feel free to retain all of your enigmatic, <laughs> you know, qualities <laughs> as well. Thank you so much for sharing that. Which which part of? Um, <clears throat> oops. I'm I'm in uh, from Nakuru. Great. I, I was with uh, some flower farmers in, in Nakuru some a few years back. Um, great oh. to have you in this session. Uh, and can you pass? Can you pass to another person here? Um, everybody uh, should get a chance to just give us sixty to ninety seconds about themselves, including Lisa and Kelly, who are uh, joining us from three fifty and for for tech support here. So feel free to call on anyone that you see here. Uh, awesome. Um, I'd love Kara. Uh, to go. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kara. I'm uh, joining in from South Dakota in the US, um, where we recently started a local uh, 350 uh, branch. Um, and we're mostly focused on like very hyper local efforts, um, trying to get our cities uh, uh, to pass a 100% emissions reduction um, plan. Um, with some social equity uh, and, climate, and climate justice provisions in there. Um, but it's really great to join you all. Um, I'll pass it on to Ruth. Hello, everyone. My name is Ruth Davis. I am the organizing director over at MN350 uh, in uh, Minnesota. Um, we are doing a variety of different things um, as it relates to climate and uh, racial and environmental justice. We have uh, uh, two different campaigns as it relates to transit. We have a, a campaign up north and towards Bemidji on uh, native land uh, where we have an organizer who was working on We Are All Treaty People. Um, we have a line three um, pipeline fight that we're continuous as well as a current line five pipeline. So just to give you an overview of some of the things that we're working on. Beautiful, thank you, Ruth. Um, great to have you. And can you, can you pass on to another person? And everybody Murphy? can also reserve the right to, uh, to decline and pass to the next person. But uh, sorry to interrupt you, Ruth. Uh, Mercy, you're up. Hello everyone, I'm Jambo. Uh, my name is Mercy. I'm from Kenya. Uh, I've been working um, on some divestment work, so especially the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, trying to get as many countries in the world to say no more fossil fuels because we don't need them anymore. We have enough already to tide us over for the next 10 years. Uh, I've also done some partner engagement work on ECOP and currently I'm just doing more of general climate organizing work. Thank you so much. And I'd like to pass over to Puja. Kuchkaho. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Pooja Tilvawala. My pronouns are she, her, her. I'm based in Ben Salem, PA. It's a suburb of Philadelphia in the US. Um, I do a lot of things uh, for the youth climate movement. So I'm part of YUNGO, that's the UNFCCC's children and youth constituency. And so there we got we get to do a lot of like uh, uh, policy intervention, negotiations of help design um, the youth day of COP27 that's coming up in Egypt. Those are just some examples. Um, and then my day job is as the youth engagement manager at the climate initiative. Um, and then I also run Youth Climate Collaborative, um, and I'm trying to focus more on like storytelling there and uh, what else, like youth and decision making stuff, trying to get more youth on different boards and uh, advisory councils. Uh, those are just some highlights. Um, I'll pass it to Phil. Great to meet a fellow Pennsylvanian. Um, beautiful. Uh, thank you, Pooja. Um, so I'm going to share uh, like way too much about myself in the session. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to pass it to Kelly. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Kelly. I'm currently the admin coordinator at 350 under the Global Campaign and Organizing Department. So I'm really, really pitting you with the movement. Um, I would say that I have been working with 350 for less than a year now but I'm like really impressed with the passion of everyone within the movement. And this is why, aside from doing tech support, I, I really like to, you know, join some of like the sessions in this training. Um, yeah, my pronouns are she and her. I am based in Berlin, but I am from the Philippines. So I'd pa pass it on to Lise. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Liz, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm based in London, I've been living here for seven and a half years, uh, but originally from France, uh, and I've been with 350 for just over a year now, uh, doing freelancing, mainly um, organizing, coordinating global mobilizations or trainings like this one. Um, and I'm also doing um, more like grassroots organizing in the UK as part of a direct action network. Uh, and I usually also go to COPS and organize uh, with the global climate justice movement there. Uh, I will pass to uh, George, have you been? Oh, thanks, Liz. Um, <clears throat> sorry, it's early in the morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, George here, calling from Fiji. Uh, yeah, I work with 350.org as the Pacific organizer, uh, based here in Suva, Fiji. Uh, we're basically working with 18 Pacific Island nation countries uh, around the region. Um, also with the diaspora, um, Australia, New Zealand, and US. Um, and basically highlighting vulnerabilities of uh, our island communities to climate change while showcasing our strength um, and resilience as people. Um, and something new that we're working on as well is around climate mobility and um, trying to input into a zero draft framework around regional um, policy that uh, looks at the uh, uh, climate mobility within the Pacific. Uh, and like a passive silence. Hey everyone, from uh, I'm a graduate uh, working with the, the local NGO on Mount Kenya Network Forum. We are the head of communications. Uh, we deal mostly with climate and this is the section that I'm heading. Uh, uh, and we have and working to ensure the great inclusion of the both special needs and how they can interrelate to the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
Great, I thanks, Silas. Yeah. To, Great, thanks, to Austin. Hi, everybody. My name is Austin. I'm a uh, graduate student at the University of South Dakota, and I'm a part of SODAC 350 with Kara and Jeff also in here. Um, like Kara said, we're working on kind of working with the city of Sioux Falls and trying to help promote their sustainability and climate action plan. And I'll pass it on to Jeff. Um, so not much to add there, except uh, South Dakota sits in the middle of the US. So flyover country is well represented here today. Mm -hmm. And I'll pass it on to who's left here. I'm not sure. I Bill. think we got everyone. Did we miss anyone? Austin, have you gone? Okay. Yes, Austin did go. Great. Time zones and uh, just really appreciate that we're, um, you know, making the most of this sort of like Zoom apocalypse and trying to like uh, get online and cooperate together. It's it's really beautiful. I know sometimes like Zoom can be extremely exhausting um, and we spend a lot of time. Um, so hopefully it's a life giving space. And, uh, you know, we'll all I'll really chill you know if you want to grab a beer if you want to get some coffee whatever it might be um i just want to share a few stories with you and what i've learned and then have a time for um you know questions feedback that kind of thing so um you know just really simple uh kind of structure here if we decide that breakout rooms would be helpful or something like that we can decide that later um so i I uh, want to share a little bit of um, of my journey, uh, particularly with a group called the National Land Defense League um, in Uganda. But I have to kind of back up a little bit in order to tell this story and give some context. Um, so I come from uh, a long line of peasant farmers, um, and there's a um, you know, a lot of my history is wrapped up in settler colonialism within North America and um, particularly on, on my father's side. Um, but I do have some like ancestors that uh, really like inspired me in the way that they fought for peasant land rights and, um, uh, you know, food security in, in centuries past. And um, through a long series of events, I found, I found myself uh, studying in in Uganda. And, um, you know, uh, this was around the time that Occupy Wall Street came up with which, um, especially the Americans in the room, and maybe others might remember that time as um, for millennials like myself, a very kind of radicalizing moment. And, um, you know, people coming together in this magical way to contest uh, corporate corporatocracy and um, corporate power, uh, money and politics, you know, um, and uh, I was one of those uh, uh, young people at that time that uh, um, all of a sudden, you know, was uh, just being swept up in this wave of everybody becoming an organizer and calling themselves an organizer. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it, it was it was it was a really magical moment, but also very challenging. Um, and um, being on, I think, the east coast of the U.S. at that time. I developed like a craving and I wanted to um, basically understand how power could be contested and how we could get power. Um, because every question in the world, you can have all kinds of beautiful technical answers um, about how to solve any kind of problem or challenge uh, in the world. Uh, we've had so many scientists point out so many things to us regarding the climate uh, crisis that we're in. Um, and the climate chaos that's ensuing. And um, it's hard to actually follow or enact any of their advice because we don't have power. Um, and I got really interested in, in this, uh, this uh, question of power. It seems like this invisible thing, yet it rules our lives. And I didn't want to only understand it from a 21st century perspective. Um, I did a lot of you know historical reading and um, I've been privileged and fortunate enough to like commit um, a lot of 
basically my whole adult life so far, I'm only 31, um, to exploring this issue of how ordinary people seize power, especially when um, those who currently entrenched by the power, money, structures, systems that they have, cultures that surround them and insulate them. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted kind of like a, a global uh, perspective on this. I wanted um, to learn from different continents. And this curiosity um, took me to be a student at um, in central Uganda in um, 2009. And when, when I was in Uganda, I got to ask some of the questions. There's a lot of complaining about corruption in Uganda. So I started to ask deeper questions. Why is there so much corruption? What are like the global politics behind this? What are the you know implications of US and European imperialism, of Chinese imperialism? Uh, how does this you know um, entrench a, a dictator like Museveni who has been in power for three and a half decades? Um, so I was asking a lot of these kind of questions with fellow students. Um, immediately when I arrived uh, on campus in, in Uganda and East Africa, um, the next week there was something called the Kabaka riots in the particular university town where I happened to be uh, going to a new school. And, um, you know, basically, I don't want to say a lot about, you know, the Kabaka riots, but um, it was this time where people were fed up with uh, a dictator's behavior and um, the tool that they felt, you know, they had to contest power in that moment was a riot. And um, the years that followed, uh, the international kind of like donor community, so to the so-called donor community, um, the, the, the global North powers uh, decided to invest more in policing, more in crowd control, more in military. Um, uh, within Uganda. Um, and so this, of course, resulted in more torture, more um, repression against uh, uh, dissidents and critics and activists and organizers across Uganda. Um, and uh, those, those university students and I, um, those university students and I uh, that had been asking these tough questions came together and said, okay, we see what they're trying to do. Maybe they mean well, but it's not really working. There needs to be some kind of grassroots um, effort um, to, um, you know, shake things up and try to get power into the hands of the people. And um, I'll, of course, I will get to in the story how this, what this has to do with climate uh, soon. But first, we were just questioning that bigger picture, that bigger picture issue of of power and and who has it. And uh, how do we how do we get it from them basically um, and 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 share it and and create the world that we want instead of being subjected to the one that powerful people are creating for us. And um, uh, there were seven or eight of us as uh, students from different universities, and so we started a group called Solidarity Uganda. And the idea was that um, we would give solidarity to communities that are. Uh, struggling the worst of the worst of the worst situations because of the dictatorship that is oppressing them. And um, we would give that solidarity in whatever form they said was <laughs> useful for them. And, you know, we're very naive, like uh, young university students, maybe still naive, but uh, a little bit less so now. And um, yes, Mercy, three and a half decades, as you know, Museveni uh, has been in power since 86. Um, so this is also one of the youngest countries in the world in terms of demographics. So the median age is uh, 17 years old. So that means more than half of the population is not even, can't drink, can't vote, um, you know, is not yet 18. Um, so, you know, this also creates a challenge in a country that's ruled by, you know, 80 year old people, octogenarians that um, control religion, business, politics, every kind of sphere of life, when there's such an extreme minority and not in touch with the challenges of today. Um, so, you, you know, you're, that means also that most of societies does not remember a time, 80% uh, of the population or more doesn't remember a time before uh, the Museveni regime. Um, and those that do uh, remember previous regimes, um, some of which were, you know, not, not as bad, 
uh, had different political values. Uh, some, some were quite uh, bad as well. Um, but, you know, there's not this uh, sort of historical memory uh, that pervades society of like a better time, you know. Um, so this is also a challenge, like building the capacity to imagine. This is part of the uh, the revolutionary um, opportunity of becoming an organizer is you're always giving, you know, everyone that you know a little bit, a little nudge, take a slightly bigger risk than you did last time, you know. Um, okay, you guys uh, got a speed hump built in your in your town through the town council. Great, you got the budget, they implemented it, they made the speed hump, there are going to be less traffic accidents. What can you do next, right? So there's this uh, beautiful opportunity of being an organizer where you get to kind of nudge Um, recognizing that they have power and recognizing that they can actually wield that power um, in all kinds of ways. Um, you're that little uh, provocateur uh, that, that, that takes uh, people that you come in contact with to the next level to become a slightly better version, <laughs> more powerful version, at least, of themselves. Um, so, um, you know, when we were building this network, Solidarity Uganda, we um, uh, we we said let's try the hardest thing first because if we're all like young broke you know university students who don't know what we're doing we don't have any like lawyers backing us up we don't have any contacts in the media we're not really like powerful or well connected if we can win in a community where things are really really bad under um, a lack of support. Um, that means good things for the future. You know, that means that uh, other communities where things aren't quite as bad can be, you know, even more powerful uh, with hopefully with our solidarity involved. And, um, uh, you know, we sat together and decided that the trickiest part of the country, the most repressive part of the country was a district called Amuru, A-M-U-R-U. I'll just type it in the chat if anybody wants to kind of look it up later. It's called Amuru District. And what was interesting about Amuru district is that, um, so in Northern Uganda, which had, you know, uh, protracted, uh, a protracted war for quite some time, um, lots of human rights abuses by uh, an armed group in the state. Um, uh, they, there were a lot of like internally displaced people's camps. So people left their ancestral lands, went to uh, places that were thought to be more secure, um, and, and kind of left their, their lands alone for some time because of the insecurity. And um, during this time, um, State House, the, the, the dictator and his family and closest, um, closest people, um, started flying investors in helicopters over, over northern Uganda and you know pointing down to the land and say, look, it's vacant, it's available, it's ready for you to to invest and start, you know, a cotton farm or start, you know, a high-end sports game hunting resort or, you know, start um, drilling, speculative drilling for, for oil, um, you know, gold, minerals, whatever, you know, it's ready for your investment. And um, uh, some, some investors are, are thought to have given them a yes and say, yeah, we're interested in this land. So, of course, this creates challenges because when... Um, when the war ends, people go back to their ancestral lands. They go back to their gardens and homesteads. Um, things have grown up. Trees have come up. Uh, landmarks are already kind of difficult to re-identify. And so there, there are some of those intra-community challenges about how we go back and resettle our land and, and continue on with our uh, life of uh, grazing animals and uh, using the forest uh, for its resources and, and gardening and farming and doing small business. So um, this community of Amuru went back to its land and already had its own fair share of internal challenges. Um, but now this land was said to have been given by the state, um, this community's land given by the state to um, two investors. One uh, by the name of Bruce Martin, uh, a South African um, sort of high-end sports game hunting investor, and the other one called Madvani Sugarcane Corporation, um, a, a multinational that, you know, just clears out the most biodiverse areas and replaces them with monocropped uh, sugarcane 
plantations, and also in addition to grabbing land, um, uh, creates a very poorly paying market, but at least a readily available market for local outgrowers to grow sugar on their own land and then sell it at a very low price to the company. So, um, so this company notorious in Uganda already is trying to now go to another part of the country and start a new factory, a new, um, a new place to, um, you know, produce sugar. Um, so, uh, because of this contestation by these large investors and the community that had lived uh, there since the, I believe it was the 14th century when they arrived, um, uh, there is this history that uh, wasn't lining up. You know, the state was saying one thing to these inv investors, and the community that has been there is saying, you know, this is actually our ancestral land. This is what we have always done, and uh, you know, we deserve to to retain it. So um, this created a lot of uh, a lot of challenges, of course, for a returning community after some decades of of conflict of armed conflict. Um, they um, they started uh, experiencing a lot of um, you know arrests. So if somebody was mobilizing the community to um, you know to protect this land from uh, the encroaching investors. Um, you know, they would go to, to jail or be tortured or disappeared. Um, there was even somebody that was publicly executed um, almost ceremoniously um, in one of the trading centers uh, over this land. So, um, you know, there, there are these uh, two big land grabs um, and the total kind of like land mass, we're talking about 100,000 acres of land. So it's a massive uh, land affecting thousands and thousands of families. Even though it's sparsely populated, it's it's still... Uh, that massive that it's uh, affecting thousands and thousands of, of farming families. Um, and so um, we as, you know, young new organizers, um, you know, we hadn't really done this before. Uh, we said, let's, let's find if there's anybody in this community that is actually trying to um, protect the land and, you know, take on the line to do so because these might be the best people to build relationships and trust with in order to um, see what kind of uh, solidarity we can lend, what they need from us, what we can learn from their from their struggle and their experiences. And um, what happened in, uh, I believe it was May 2012, April or May 2012, um, the president actually flew with his helicopter to, um, to, to Amuru. And uh, he stopped at a at a primary school, and he told the community there that um, if they didn't surrender their land to Madhvani Sugarcane Corporation, he would deny this district uh, any education services, any roads, and any um, like uh, you know cell phone network infrastructure, that kind of thing. Um, so he was deliberately saying no state budgets from your taxpayer monies are going to be allowed to enter this district if you don't surrender the land. So it was a threat. And when he gave that threat, um, some women disrobed. And um, in their society, if, you, if you're an old woman and you point your breasts at, um, at somebody, it's like a bad omen. It's a curse. Um, and so when these women did that, um, the military pointed their guns and then Museveni, the dictator, uh, told them, uh, no, don't, don't shoot these women. And um, he flew away from that place and never came back. Um, but he started sending, you know, whoever he appoints uh, from, from State House to continue this effort to try to grab the community's land. Uh, you know, the, the community had resisted with a variety of means, um, some violent but unarmed means, and then some nonviolent means. Um, so we can talk about that later if it, it's, it's a bit of a rabbit trail from the story that I want to share. But, um, you know, we uh, um, identified uh, some of the community members that had mobilized this resistance um, to uh, Museveni's, you know, uh, evil speech that he gave at this primary school. Um, and uh, they, they invited us to their community. And this is, this is a very uh, traumatized and skeptical, uh, rightfully skeptical 
community. So we knew that uh, it was we had to be humble, you know, in order to um, receive their hospitality. Many people, especially for myself, a foreigner, uh, any foreigner that had gone there, some had been attacked. Some Italians had been attacked. If there's anybody that looks like an Indian, they're just, you know, they were attacked uh, because there's that affiliation with the Madhvani Corporation, which is run by Indians. So um, uh, we had to kind of like be on the phone with them a few times and, and say, you know, we, re we really would like to give our solidarity. We believe in your cause. Your cause is righteous to protect this land, you know, and we want to be behind that. Uh, winning their trust and showing that we are not spies, we're not coming on behalf of a company. Uh, it's it's long and it was patient, but uh, I think what uh, really helped was when we said, you know, we we will come there at your hospitality and and uh, meet with uh, the people in your community, um, because they had always said if anybody wants to get this land, then they need to negotiate directly with the owners of it, which is this community. It's it's collectively owned and managed by um, you know cult the cultural institution of this of this particular Muru district. Um, and so we went and, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, had a meeting with this community. We arrived at 2, 2 p.m. And um, my friends in this room that are from East Africa can tell you that, you know, along the equator, uh, Tropic of Capricorn kind of zone, the sun goes down more or less pretty consistently each day, uh, regardless of season. And uh, so we knew that we had, you know, five hours before the sun would go down. And uh, like every hour or so, a new person would show up. People walked from, you know, 30 kilometers away, 40 kilometers away, taking their whole day to walk and have this meeting. Um, you know, local leaders, uh, cultural leaders, um, you know, people basically that had um, been organizing with their community to try to protect the land. And I think for me, this was like a learning moment about how, um, serious this, this was, um, people did want to wait all the way until night to have the meeting because that's what made them feel more secure. And then that night we slept um, at somebody's home and then a few people stayed awake all night, you know, kind of guarding the door. And, and this experience like um, helped me really their experiences. And so I think one thing about being, one takeaway that I hope, um, I can offer is is that um, you know um, having that desire to learn about what people are going through is really important for organizers. Um, entering into their experiences, it's always going to be trivial. You know, you're never going to fully, truly like enter into their experiences to the possibility of entering into their experience as much as 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 you can, you know, to have that willingness to to learn from what they're going through, um, from the challenges that they have, and then to be honest also about your own challenges. Um, maybe you also have a child and you're concerned about the, you know, the future of the climate as it as it might affect your your children's lives. You know, find those areas to connect on and and um, find a common struggle, a common enemy, a common goal, um, something that uh, you know makes your experiences similar enough to have that human kind of uh, contact and touch. And for us, it was listening to Dolly Parton, you know, all night, these guys guarding the Dolly Parton. I never had been interested in Dolly Parton, but now every time I, I listen to Dolly Parton, Parton songs, there's like that nostalgic effect of uh, being in, you know, remembering my, my friends and comrades there. Um, so, we uh, had carried out, you know, some meetings and uh, on the way back in the morning, we suffered some arrests and I won't get into all of that, but, you know, um, it took a long time to like build trust with this community. Uh, but once we had it, they were all in and uh, they went, you know, village to village, um, raising consciousness about uh, uh, civil resistance, basically, and, and how we can actually wage our power to, uh, you know, uh, harness our collective power to protect this land and what kinds of strategies and tactics we can use and how we can mobilize people. And, and uh, you know, as this, uh, as a few people, uh, we can talk about the snowflake model of organizing. It's, it's kind of one of the models that we didn't know we were using, but we're kind of using where uh, you have like a, a sort of maybe five or six people that you know, 
and uh, they're quite motivated, quite dedicated. Um, and that way you don't need to know everyone. They, they also know five or six people, right? Um, so just like a snowflake has that kind of crystalline structure where the center is, uh, you know, replicated, it's a fractal, it's a pattern that keeps replicating outward, uh, but the same sort of, you know, I don't know if chemical structure is the right hard science word, but the same, you know, structure just duplicating itself at scale. Um, that's what a snowflake does to become a snowflake, right? So um, similarly, movements, um, in order to grow, in order to get numbers and build people power, um, you know, they can often replicate themselves in such a way that, um, you know, Austin, you don't need to know a hundred different organizers. Silas, you don't need to know 200 different organizers. You just need to know five or six who also know five or six. And we're all sort of loosely connected in this web. Um, so through those uh, networks that already existed in this community, um, you know, then the only kind of revolutionary ingredient that was needed is, uh, you know, sort of strategy and tactics. You know, already it's a well-organized community. Now, how can we resist to, 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 to build our power and protect this land? So to make a long story short, one day, um, or at least shorter, sorry, this isn't very short. Um, uh, there was a community that um, uh, within Amuru that uh, something leaked to them that there was a government convoy that was sent from Kampala eight hours away by road um, to redistrict the land. So they were gonna have the minister of lands, housing, and urban development, and they were going, going to have the Minister of Internal Affairs with an mil armed military convoy bringing new mark stones, you know, just physical, actual stones, and this is also abnormal in Uganda, to say, to put them down in the ground and say, this is where uh, Ajumani district, the adjacent district where the ruling party had a lot of political leadership and power, begins. Because if they could say that this is Ajumani and not Amuru, then the land giveaway to these uh, corporate powers could be swifter and easier for the state to accomplish. Um, so uh, when the news leaked, this community that had already been training itself and having all these planning meetings about how we can protect this land, they swung into action. There were, you know, primary school students by the hundreds going into the uh, the, the good thing about the bad infrastructure in Amuru district is that there's basically only one road, you know, to this to this particular place. And so, um, you know, the, the primary school children took their leaves and went with their teachers and, you know, flooded the, the road uh, with their jogging and marching and, and, and songs. And uh, what really, um, what really turned the tides and, and um, was kind of a, a beautiful moment uh, a watershed moment, maybe, is what we might call it, um, was when uh, the con the government convoy arrived and uh, they found this community already clogging up the road, you know, bringing their cattle on the road, you know, just creating so much of a buzz on the road and so many roadblocks. Um, and when, you know, the, the military escort um, for these big uh, political leaders you know, started getting out their weapons and everything. Again, six grandmothers came out, disrobed and uh, cursed the two uh, ministers that had come to facilitate this redistricting, this gerrymandering kind of exercise. And um, one of the ministers started crying and the other one turned away in shame. And um, they actually thwarted the whole exercise and they were able to on that day protect their land. And uh, for us, uh, you know, as a little tiny scrappy organization trying to support a very powerful community um, that clearly had a very long history of struggle against this very oppressive opponent, um, uh, this was very inspiring. Um, you know, we had the privilege of entering into their experience and, and being a part of um, of this very powerful thing that they had done. They, they had really uh, thwarted this uh, redistricting exercise. And um, all kinds of calls started this time on this, uh, on this particular action, as opposed to the one when the president came, where there was almost no press. Um, and, uh, you know, people from all around the country started, uh, we started seeing, you know, elderly women stripping naked, uh, disrobing rather to, to protect their land. We started to see, you know, a lot of people rise action to um, 
to protect their land. And, um, you know, we, it was a point of reflection for us. Uh, and, and we said, you know, I think like sort of as a, this, you know, this has been a really good learning experience. Like this could, we're trying to build and uh, requests from around the country of Uganda, not all of them, but quite a number, you know, saying we also have a land issue with this, uh, issue with this politician um, uh, trying to steal a large amount of land. And, um, you know, we, we didn't really have the capacity to, to, to support all these communities. And we were really just learning from this community about uh, how to actually success, succeed in, in, in such a thing. And, um, but we said, you know, we'll try our best. And um, we started to build kind of like a network of a regional network of, um, of, of organizers and then of uh, educators and trainers that could teach about uh, nonviolent resistance that could teach about civil resistance that could teach about community organizing and um, that way we would be able to kind of absorb at scale um, you know the requests coming in for for kind of strategic support and uh, and 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 relationships that we could build to to wage struggle against um, a, a dictator that's very hungry to steal land and um, uh, we didn't have, of course, the funds to scale up and like build the infrastructure, but we had the commitment and the network. And those were like the two most important things. And as you start to like get some victories, you can sometimes do some fundraising. Unfortunately, like it would be nice, you know, if the if money could come first and then you can use money to organize. That's usually not the case. You usually have to have some kind of like victories under your belt. You have to score some wins and then, you know, people take notice. Um, so you know, it took it took a lot of uh, like like uh, it was challenging, um, but uh, we we came into contact with you know quite a number of communities, including um, an indigenous group called the Benet and Mount Elgon. I'll type it in the chat. Benet of Mount Elgon. Um, they're quite an inspiring um, indigenous minority community of I think about seven thousand population uh, that has for several generations been trying to uh, reclaim their and the ancestral highlands of, of Mount Elgon um, from, from this, you know, sort of state occupation. Um, and uh, we, we partnered with quite a number of communities to also try to stop uh, similar large scale land grabs and not all were successful, but about six or seven were successful. And uh, then we started to notice another challenge that um, when a community wins or chases off a land grabber or makes things expensive or complicated enough for be partially protects the land, maybe they don't achieve everything, but at least their struggle results in things not being as bad as they otherwise would be. Um, we found uh, that those communities that were victorious in their local struggles would then sort of sit back and relax. And uh, then, then uh, I'll go back to the point that I made earlier about the job of an organizer being to nudge people to take another, another step. Okay, you achieve X, it's now time to the, um, the sort of the learning zone. You know, you don't want to push someone too, too much in such a radical, ambitious direction that they just feel so put off by it that it's totally impossible. And you don't want to um, be so incrementally thin with them that they, uh, you know, they're not really achieving much and it's taking a lot of your own energy. Yeah, you want to find that sweet spot in between that um, is is what we call the learning zones. You step a little bit out of your comfort zone, not too far, but a little bit out of your comfort zone. And so, an organizer really tries to find that learning zone for people. How can we learn and grow? How can we discover our own power just a little bit more than last time? And so for, for this, um, this uh, sort of nascent network that didn't have any infrastructure and was sort of communities here and there in different kingdoms, different regions of the country, far opposite corners of the country, how could we unite facing a common Japanese land grabbing regime? How could we uh, unite and affect policy? How could we unite and affect uh, the implementation of neoliberal um, 
you know, practices um, and, and the private sector's takeover of land in, in Uganda. And um, the way that, you know, there, there were four of us asking this question. We sat down in a few meetings, and this is another beautiful thing. I, I can hear already um, a few of you saying, yeah, we have a small enclave, a small group within our community. Um, like I've had the, 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 the real privilege of being with so many powerful movements around the world and learning from them. And what I see almost consistently is that it starts with like roughly 10 people. You know, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's 12, sometimes it's six, but it's a small number of people. Um, and if you think about the number of people that can sit around a dinner table and maintain the same one conversation without it being fractured into two conversations, uh, without having to kind of, you know, build protocol and bylaws, this is how we make a decision together, but it just sort of organically happens around the table. It's it's roughly that number, right? You're all focused on the topic at hand uh, because it's a small enough group. So there's really no substitute in organizing for these small groups that try to do something together. Um, another another thing that you can um, that you can research when you get time sort of on the side is affinity groups. I've listed it in, in the chat. Uh, there's ways that even very large and massive movements uh, make decisions across their membership together through affinity groups, or at least organize, you know, mass protests, for example, through affinity groups. It's a way to get many, many small groups to kind of cooperate on a common objective or goal. Um, so uh, back back to this sort of story, and I'll try to you know pick things up and not be so terribly long-winded. Um, so uh, when these groups um, were, uh, when we were recognizing this challenge, as I mentioned, that uh, groups were, okay, now we have one, let's sit back and wait. Maybe five years, five years later, the land grabber will, will come back or another land grabber will come, but for now we're all right. There wasn't that culture of solidarity uh, being nurtured among neighboring communities, neighboring tribes, neighboring um, you know, people affected by more or less the same thing. Um, so when we wanted to build this national network, we knew it was gonna be challenging. There are so many languages in Uganda. Um, the demographics are so diverse. Um, and if we were going to do this at the national level as we should, as you know, new neoliberal land reforms were coming through Uganda's parliament, we knew that it was gonna be a challenge internally just to handle like minor logistics like communication. Um, so, um, you know, four of us got together and uh, we decided, let's just start with those communities that were victorious. Let's not invite everyone around the same table. Let's start from a point of strength and uh, let's not do it in the capital city. Let's go to the site of one of these land grabs and that community will host like a national launch of this movement. We will invite people from all of these successful land defense struggles. And uh, then we'll, like this community will give birth to the National Land Defense League. Um, and so then we had this other challenge because um, as, a, as an American like wor who works you know, mostly in East Africa global, with Global South communities, um, I, like I know the language sometimes slips between nonprofit, NGO, seen the challenge of how uh, non-profitization or NGOization can kind of co-opt uh, um, or, or, or make less effective, at least, um, uh, the struggles and the power that we're trying to build together, you know, through these very bureaucratic and formal cultures and processes and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we were noticing this. We were noticing that uh, sometimes communities would completely forget that the the objectives that they identified that we need to protect our land and you know another organization would start a land rights uh, a women's land rights program for example and call them for all these meetings and then they would start getting t-shirts and then they would start getting you know uh um transportation refunds uh like ra rather generous transportation refunds from some of these larger you know kind of uh organizations and um, we noticed that this was dividing communities. Something as petty as a t-shirt was dividing uh, communities against themselves. Some communities that get to go to some of these uh, fancy hotels for a meeting 
get a t-shirt, they come back. And instead of that mobilizing people, people are actually jealous or, you know, why didn't I get to go to this meeting? And this wasn't the point. The whole point was, you know, this community identified that we need to protect this, this land, but uh, such distractions came in and we saw that they were a real threat to uh, the power of, of the communities and, and the network. And um, so we kind of decided nothing like t-shirts, you know, nothing where in a central way we need to raise a budget. And this gets me to the principle, like, which I think is a universal, a universal principle, uh, which is uh, to use organizing strategies that have the possibility of scaling up. And what I mean by that is um, organizing strategies that are accessible to any potential or would-be members. Uh, everything they have is already right there for them. Um, so for us, uh, we we asked ourselves, you know, not everybody has like a red T-shirt, for example. Um, and if we do need to get red T-shirts, then we're going to need to raise money and budgets and find a service provider to print them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what people do have is millet, millet flour. Millet is the, you know, it's like the great grain superfood of, of East Africa. Um, it's very nutritious. It's, uh, it's, it's indigenous to the area. And um, everybody, uh, when they cook millet, comes together around a basket, an indira. Um, and you dip your hands into the basket and eat a common meal, yeah? Um, so it has that kind of political significance that coming together, there's that joy, that feast of a delicious, there's this pride, you know, that people have when they eat, uh, eat kalo, uh, this, this millet bread uh, that's made at home. Um, in almost every, uh, every area across Uganda, you will find people really excited about millet. So we said, you know, uh, farmers farm millet and can carry a millet stock. Uh, people cook millet at home and they can make feasts. So uh, let's organize around millet. You know, uh, if you want to make your chapter of the National Land Defense League, the only thing you need to do is to make millet, call your... Uh, um, ask, how are we going to protect our land? And we just eat together and we're talking and we've made a chapter. So it was this accessible, you know, basically no cost way of um, allowing people to self-identify and join in. Um, you know, we made it access accessible. We created this point of entry that anybody could just step through the door. Um, and uh, of course, when this uh, launch happened, uh, this launch of the National Land Defense League, communities got curious and uh, a lot of chapters formed. Um, just a quick anecdote that a few months after the launch, this Amuru community, and this was years after the earlier story I told, um, that there started to be um, arsons. And um, they had to go back to the drawing board and say, what do we do? And uh, what they decided was to occupy a United Nations office about two, three hours away from, it was like the nearest United Nations office to their community. So uh, 232 um, people, including children and infants, um, came to um, this office and occupied it for 33 days to call upon the UN to um, uh, basically ask the government to stop killing them and to stop burning down their homes and forcefully evicting them from their ancestral lands. And there's a lot to say about that story that's uh, quite inspiring, but um, for the takeaway about organizing, what was interesting about it was that at that time, the National Land Defense League, despite being so young, its members swung into action. And Uganda is a very, you know, has tons of NGOs, really relies on, you know, patronage politics and, um, you know, um, you know, everybody's sort of like waiting for another person to, to mobilize them because of how many nonprofits and NGOs there are. Um, and um, this network, National Land Defense League, didn't have any of that in its blood, you know. Its members from different kingdoms around the country said, yes, we must stand with our chapter in Amuru. And they would go door to door asking, you know, different people, can you contribute a kilo, kilo of beans from your garden? Can you send a few chickens? And then when the more formal organizations wanted to come in and support, all they had to do was now give a budget for a big truck, you know, to, 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 
you know, to, to, to load up all of these things being donated to send to the occupation so that the occupation could have food. As I share this with you, with you all some years after that occupation, um, there, there is like a half a year long, six months, I think there are now up to like seven months long occupation happening in another district of Uganda uh, in relation to the National Land Defense League. So this, um, you know, it's had its high and low peaks um, uh, as, a, as a kind of nascent movement of um, a lot of elderly women, farmers and youth. Uh, across mostly rural Uganda, but um, it, it's it's a it's a it's quite a powerful network and um, really doesn't have its organizing clearly defined, and uh, it's you know network and infrastructure and how it all works it's not very clearly defined, and I think in a lot basically every movement you're somewhere between clarity and lack of clarity, and um, you have to find a way to kind of like. Create enough structure, because if you want to be more horizontal, more cooperative, you need more structure, not less. Uh, and we can get into that if, if it's of interest to, to those who are here. Um, so, um, you know, uh, you need to be kind of flexible enough, but also have the, infra the infrastructure that serves you. You need to be able to create that. So there are a lot of questions, you know, a lot of rabbit trails we could take from this point. Um, so, uh, I've belabored the, the story a lot. Um, just uh, just one quick uh, theory to mention, if I'm trying to kind of like wrap this up into some bite-sized kind of takeaways. Um, there's one theory called Dunbar's number, and it's sort of, I think, a psychology theory that talks about how the human brain can hold like 150 primary relationships, you know, where you know the name of this person and you know what's going on in their lives. You know, you're your closest relatives, the people you care about the most that matter the most to you, maybe close colleagues, etc. Um, so therefore, you know, we can't be connected to everyone. Uh, we have to find a way to, as organizers, cooperate at scale. And that means that you need to know people who know people. So that's one takeaway that I that I want to make. Um, I've I had the chance um, during the pandemic to do some research uh, interviewing organizers from all kinds of issue areas, generations, demographics from across six continents, um, you know, working with all kinds of models of org organizing. And there are five takeaways that um, really quick, I just want to kind of more methodically go through, um, and then we'll hand, hand the mic over to the rest of you. Um, so the common things that came out of this uh, study that I took a few months doing was that one, uh, movements often grow without a foundation. And then if that foundation is not in place, uh, it's, uh, it's really hard to recover it. Um, and the climate movement is probably the best example of this, uh, the recent climate movements. Um, you know, uh, I think it's Sunrise Movement that talks about we need to go slow at first so that Later, we can go fast, I'm paraphrasing. Um, you know, we, we, we build that infrastructure until we have that trust. Once we have that trust and that infrastructure, that culture, how do we make decisions? Then we can go fast together. Um, and then uh, um, Extinction Rebellion also, um, I think, grew a lot and, and even lent their comments to this study that I did, uh, grew a lot um, really fast, especially amongst uh, white European demographics. And when they realized that they were losing people that didn't fall within that uh, privileged demographic, they had to work backwards and undo a lot of, um, you know, the kind of community building and, and culture that they were putting in place. And that was really tough, you know, it took a lot of time to do that. Um, so for those of you who are new, when I asked on a scale of one to five, how much organizing experience do you have? Um, don't feel pressured to become, you know, a veteran organizer, somebody that's extremely effective and powerful. Uh, don't don't feel that way. Go slow. Learn together. Be with people. Um, we all have know how to have relationships. We are social creatures. Be yourself. Um, take that time to uh, to listen, to learn. Go slowly. Build the infrastructure that you need. With climate anxiety, we're always told the opposite, you know, and we have to, this is an emergency time, right? Like we need to do things now, yeah? We need to do things yesterday. Um, but uh, we can't do that 
at the expense of um, actually, you know, understanding what it is that we're putting in place because it's going to create challenges for us later. Um, so build that foundation, whatever that might mean for you in your respective context. And um, the second thing that we saw in the study is that um, organizers often fail to identify and work work with their own verticality. What do I mean by verticality, like hierarchy, how, um, privilege, um, as there's this kind of activist and organizer culture that tends to fetishize the horizontal. And, you know, we say, ah, oh, we are all equal here. We are all leaders, but we don't really define what that means for us in terms of making decisions. And if we just sort of believe it as this wishy-washy kind of thing, then what happens often in groups is that the social dynamics default to the person in the room that has the most power, maybe the most experience, maybe is the most um, uh, like strong-willed or outspoken. You know, there are certain personality types or demographics at play that may um, make it challenging to to actually move forward together. So, recognize. No, there's nothing in the world that's completely horizontal because we all come from different experiences, privileges, et cetera. Um, and, and so, you know, we have to look at those dynamics critically. Um, and then we can decide, okay, how do we make decisions together? Who makes what kinds of decisions and how? Um, so recognizing that we're always both vertical and horizontal, but what's gonna work for us? And how can we actually um, uh, live within our values? What kind of uh, system can we create together in order to make decisions together? Um, the third thing that we saw, I know I'm going through these things and really kind of <laughs> touching on them way too fast. I can share the study later as well. The third thing is that uh, organizers are often expected to work within a one size fits all framework. And it's really helpful, you know, sometimes for a movement as big as 350 to say, this is how we organize. We need a coordinator for communications at every level of, you know, uh, every sub-regional level or something, you know, it sometimes it helps to have those things prescribed for us because then we don't need to build it all from scratch. We can say, oh yeah, yeah, sure. I can volunteer to be the social media engagement person for, you know, region A, B, C, D. Um, so that, that does help, but um, we can never be reduced to a position. Um, we can never be reduced to a job description or um, a biography, right? We are complex creatures. So uh, recognizing that we don't need to squeeze into what's prescribed for us, even if what's prescribed for us does give some preliminary direction. And then the fourth thing we saw is that um, movements often lack horizontal accountability. So accountability is really important. Movements are meant to move. We don't want to slow down and be so lethargic and not do anything. We're meant to move and change the world, yeah? Um, but um, uh, we have to have that accountability along the way because it builds trust. When we lose accountability, then our conflicts start to become internal, and uh, we often lose sight of uh, of the goal, of the opponents that we have, of the targets that we're trying to to uh, to to persuade or move. Um, so, uh, building horizontal accountability is important. It doesn't look like uh, a corporation or a government. You know, accountability must look um, to um, the people that are most affected by. The issues, issues that we're fighting for. Uh, the fifth thing that we found in the study is um, that movements have a challenge identifying whether or not, and also how to work with other movements. Um, and this is obviously the case within the climate justice struggle as well. Yes, we share common interests. We have Fridays for Future. We have Extinction Rebellion. We have we have all kinds of indigenous communities. You know, there are all kinds of organizations to support this work. And sometimes it feels quite confusing and we don't really have the tools for figuring out how to work with those other groups. Um, but there are some people that have started speculating about tools that can help us uh, 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 determine who we should work with and how. Um, and may, so I'm throwing all this out there basically to um, whet our appetites for whatever questions or comments you might have. Perhaps you have a reaction to any story I shared or any um, any kind of principle that I'm trying to tie in here. Um, I would love to hear from you all uh, where you want to take this. So I'm going to turn off my microphone and, and pass it on to you. The floor is open. Maybe what we could do is um, 
just have a cue. So uh, feel free to use the the raise your hand feature if uh, if we can give you the floor. Um, you know, try to keep your comments um, brief and accommodating for uh, the the rest of the thirty minutes that we have together. So if you go down to reactions at the bottom of the screen, you can then click raise hand. And then when you're finished talking, you can click the lower hand button. Maybe it's a bit of information overload, you know, for me to talk at you for a full hour. Um, you know, criticism also welcome. Bad jokes welcome. Well, I'll I'll pipe in and say that that a seemingly specific story was um, it opened up a whole lot of windows. Um, it seemed pretty universal uh, for a um, uh, for an I guess a narrow perspective. It 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 was inspiring there on how many notes I found myself taking. So thank you for that. Many thanks for the appreciation, Jeffrey. Is there anything that uh, you were surprised um, resonated with your experience that you could share with us? Well, um, I, I'd say that we've been uh, careful and cognizant so far in our organization to um, do it without alienation and um at, at this stage we're trying to invite as many uh as as many groups within the community as we can find to uh give voice to to our goal which is to help the city adopt a sustainability and climate action plan um so that that resonated um uh one of our members, Michael Heisler, has, has uh, been very careful to point out that if you grow too fast, you will collapse very fast too. So um, the, the caution is, is appreciated. I think for um, anybody is welcome to to chime in. Um, for me, as I think a white North American, I've had to like really manage my anxiety around climate organizing. Um, I've been a part of too many projects that feel this need to move fast because maybe there's a real looming threat uh for the first time that someone is ever experiencing that that feeling of that real looming imminent threat in their lives um maybe not to trivialize it too much but and maybe to hyperbolize to make a point but um uh, it's something that is really hard i think to 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 go slow in a time of emergency <laughs> um there are things that um you know the thief breaks into the house you need to take action and it's not going to be perfect you know you need to, you don't have time to sit back and strategize. You have to do something right now. Um, and yet at the same time, we need to be patient. It's it's a it's a paradox and contradiction that um, I'm still trying to figure out how to sit with. It's It's hard for me. Thanks for sharing that, Jeffrey. Does anybody else have uh, any feedback 
I mean, I have other notes, but I feel like I've already overloaded a lot. Mercy, you're unmuted. Uh, I wanted to say I am quite impressed about how you've been accommodating of the cultural context of Uganda, because I can imagine there was a lot of shock and but being just being able to recognize that this is what works in this context and just making space for that. And also, I like the note about making entry points into organizations and not just viewing them as static things that need to work once and for all. And we're going to do it with this set group of people and that's it. You always need to have channels where people can join in, join in on the action. So I think those two were really, really stood out for me. Thanks for sharing that. Um, there was one really, um, could I say like a mentor or like an experienced organizer that told me that the biggest reason that any of us do something is because someone asked us to. So maybe, you know, it, it does start with that, you know, uh, asking more people <laughs> to, to do something opening that door and I also find it interesting how you mentioned um, the story where there was this other organization fracturing the movement because in most in instances people don't think they are doing some sort of harm but it just put this in it, it brings it to the forefront just how some we need to find ways to work together and not fracture each other's actions in a way. Mm. Thank you for sharing that comrade, yeah. Um, and it's, um, there is this like principle within maybe activist culture of do no harm that many people try to observe. And uh, there's, debates about what it means to do no harm. Um, and especially within the climate movement, then there are even deeper debates about what does it mean to, to do no harm. Um, and also there is maybe the recognition that um, this thing is pretty complex and we are gonna do harm. Mm -hmm. I'm, very, I'm very sure I have done harm, even to people that I... And to comrades that I've had the pleasure of meeting. Um, I'm very sure I've done some harm. And um, it's, um, we live in this age of cancel culture, you know, like you do a little bit of harm and you're out. And that seems relevant to this discussion. I'm not really sure how, but, uh, uh, it seems relevant to the discussion. Can I jump in and say something? This is Ruth uh, Davis. Um, I think um, it's huge as it relates to intent versus impact. So how, if I am not intending on harming um, but I did, and the realization of I did this, and then how do how do we move forward from it? I, I won't even say fix, but how do we move forward from? How do I learn from the harm that I committed or that I did? How do I change that? And then how do we move forward together from it? Because we still need each other together as well. Is my thoughts behind that? Do you, Ruth, or anybody else here have a response to that question? I think that it's going to be important that we, um, I think a lot of times there's the lack of intentional listening to whoever the organization or the group or the audience. Um, is an intentionally listen, not listening for a rebuttal, 
not listening um, to just give a response, but intentionally listening to who that audience is, who that organization, who that group is um, that you have caused the harm to. And then collaborating or coming together and better understanding how I committed it, what did I do wrong, what can I do different going forward, and then how we can work together. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, it sounds um, just easier said saying, you know, um, but also a lot to hold. somebody close to me is like you know studied psychology and took me through 16personalities.com which is kind of like a western psychology myers briggs thing where you learn your personality type um and of course 16 different you know breaking down 7 billion of our species into 16 personalities may be a bit superficial but when i saw my personality type and then i read about you know my strengths and weaknesses I was like okay this really does describe me and then you know it, it described me how I am as a friend how I am as a parent how I am as a partner how I am as a worker you know I as I read other people um and the kinds of uh, space that I'm capable or or might be more challenging for me to create um with different kinds of groups. So uh, there are many kinds of personality assessments, of course. Um, for me, that just just doing that sort of like uh, self-reflection on how I come off to others, it's hard to kind of step outside of yourself and um, think about the inadvertent harm you might be causing. But um, it's, a, it's a good exercise for organizers. It's also good for, we did it with Solidarity Uganda. Um, we went to an island one one, uh, there's an island district of something like 80 something islands, about 60 something of them are populated uh, in Uganda. And uh, we just took a few days to kind of understand each other. You know, we're in this really mess of severe repression, a very repressive state. Uh, um, you know, carving out that space and time to actually be human together, to understand each other more deeply, to ask about your hopes and fears, you know, Creating all that time is actually very meaningful and, and helpful for the social fabric of a group. And the more trust you have, you know, you move at the speed of trust. This is, I'm now appropriating words of Adrian Marie Brown, who's a, a great organizer um, from, from the United States. Um, so you're not gonna really achieve um, what you want to. You can also work and organize with people that you don't trust, but having some clarity about the boundaries. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking to some of the East Africans in the room. You've probably collaborated with people that you're not sure whether you can trust or not um, because of various factors. And uh, you can actually work with each other. It's, it's hard, it, it goes slower. Um, you know, you're not ready to make a big splash together until you're really more certain. Uh, but yeah, carving out that space to, to learn about yourself, but also within the context of the team that you're on is, is something that I found to be really quite useful. Another way to think about it might be um, that uh, there might be a time not to organize, not to recruit people. Sometimes in the climate struggle, you may need five people who can monkey wrench 
and you know stop a large truck from making a shipment or something and you know you really don't need to recruit hundreds of people you might just need that small kind of a group that already has a lot of internal trust but then you want to think about how that action can inspire other groups similar groups to come up or contribute to a broader campaign um you know how can it not be done in isolation how can it be incorporated as part of a broader more powerful um movement or effort um so when not to organize is also a consideration um sometimes you know what uh, tilts the balance um for lgbt comes out and that's what really you know that pop culture moment is what was needed and maybe yeah of course organizing still needed to be done there's no substitute for it but um you know cool tool that we have but it's not the only tool are there any other reflections the space is open still for 15 more minutes Uh, I am going through a challenge. Maybe uh, I can give a little bit of a, a real world, <laughs> real time case study here. Um, I'm going through a challenge with um, a group of 300 people right now that is physically present uh, where I am, um, trying to. Um, land on one or two clear objectives across tremendous diversity of over 50 like to put it in the form of nation states there are over 50 nation states represented in this group of 300 people um and we're trying to come to one or two clear objectives and um we have one more day to do that <laughs> and we haven't gained much ground in the past two days does anybody have any advice? Maybe a little bit more context, like what are you working towards? What has the have you been? What tactics have you been trying the past two days? Um, yeah, what what are the demographics of the group? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It is a Pan African uh, group, and I am um, just hoping I'm just hosting like a little. Um, you know, in any any group, you have a spectrum of opinions. Um, I think our spectrum is from the my opinion and the opinion of um, you know people that I think our values overlap enough. Overlap enough. Um, we find ourselves like on the political left, and we would like the objectives of this movement to <laughs> be very clear on the political left and not vague and say, oh, you know, justice and dignity for all and. You know, yes, uh, we want those things, but also that language can easily, you know, Total or Chinese National Offshore Oil Company can come in and give justice and dignity for all and their their own way of looking at things. Um, so uh, the tactic that uh, we've been using is to to try to tilt the conversation and our preferred politics um, is to get uh, people in the evening that share our values around a campfire and talking, um, having a drink together and figuring out how we can influence the main program. Uh, we have like a few people in the coordinating team that actually quite a number that share our values. 
So it feels a bit like the, the sort of central organizing team has strong values and then the members who are present, um, some of them share those values, but maybe the majority don't. Um, so it's a bit of an interesting thing because you don't want to undermine, you know, democratic process and all that kind of thing. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to compromise on your on your on your values. Um, so I don't know if that helps Mercy to to get more of a specific response from you. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe explore more on the values and experiences and maybe try to come up with a shared vision of what you want to achieve, I guess. That's the best advice I, I, I would come up with, given the details. Thank you, thank you. I was looking for, you know, the perfect silver bullet that would change everything in your response, right? So lots of leaning on you. Um, there's a great comment from George in the chat. Uh, thank you, George. And um, actually, it, it it reminds me, I could share um, a bit of a toolbox that um, I helped develop uh, with a group called Beautiful Trouble, um, which I've been a part of for, I think, since 2015, 2016. Um, there is a principle within this toolbox that speaks to exactly what uh, George is talking, talking about, take leadership from the most impacted people. Um, they will always be the ones that uh, that you can, you know, best enlist because they stand to gain or lose something uh, fr from, you know, the work that you're doing. Um, so they'll be committed, you know, and uh, they're the best people to take direction from. Um, if you go to beautifultrouble.org and you click on the link that says toolbox, um, it will take you to this toolbox that has hundreds and hundreds of of uh, stories, tactics, principles, theories, and methodologies. You can also, there are a few ways to use the toolbox. You can, you can click sets, and then there are a few uh, kind of thematically specific kinds of sets, you know, and there's one for organizing 101. So um, I'm making the assumption that many of you ended up in this session because you were interested in organizing, and that's what I was asked to come and talk about. Um, so this would be a starting point for some tools on organizing. We are going to develop more methodologies for this um, uh, organizing set uh, that talk about how to actually do the organizing because this toolbox is more strong in creative activism and, and strategy and tactics than it is in the, the sort of nitty gritties of organizing. But at least here, you, you do see, you know, follow the lead of the most impacted is somewhat related to it, I think what, um, what George is sharing in the chat. Uh, but there are a number of things here, and you can, um, here, here's one that I shared today, use organizing strategies that scale, um, written up by one of our comrades called, uh, my face is also there. Um, uh, we got a lot of the theory from, I think this is wrong and it needs to be changed. We got a lot of the theory from uh, somebody called Fiona Chokusima, who is also listed in this toolbox elsewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, she she talked a lot about how uh, in Western Uganda, uh, recruitment was done for this movement. Uh, so as you click any tool, you can go through and read more in depth about that particular tool, you know, real world applications. Uh, there's a lot to click around. If there are tools that you like, you can click this little heart and then you can go to my tools and then you can download a PDF and it will just uh, automatically create a little mini book out of the tools that you like. So sometimes when a campaign comes to me and says, you know, we have the, such and such challenges, can you give us some direction? Um, instead of, you know, telling them what to do. Well, okay, I have a lot selected in mine, you know, it's like over 80 pages. Um, but, you know, I'll just click three or four and then I export a PDF and, and drop it to them. So there's a lot of ways to use this toolbox. I just dig around in it sometime and, and see if there's anything that might, you know, be, be useful for you and your struggles. Um, I do want to share my contacts. Um, I, uh, you know, for the past several years, I was just kind of like uh, doing scrappy organizing for no pay, or sometimes I would get a little money or something and, you know, keep my family afloat to give my contribution to our budget. Um, but uh, lately, I got like a nine to five job that allows me to be 
um, an organizer and support organizers and support uh, movements um, and do more climate justice work. Um, so that gives me enough space in my life. Um, or if I can't directly maybe connect you to um, people that are facing or have gone through similar challenges that you have. So I would love it if anybody wants to get, um, and thanks Kelly for sharing the link in the chat. If anybody wants to um, you know, get in touch or if you have a specific challenge that maybe you don't wanna discuss in this group and would rather discuss you know, one-on-one, -on -one, um, I might know some folks you know, to put you in touch with that have gone through the same thing and can speak about their experience or maybe I've experienced it myself. Um, so uh, yeah, it would be great to be in touch. Um, I'll share that uh, that uh, email in the chat. This is my email. And uh, there are two emails. That's the email that uh, is my professional email. Here's my personal email. It's all the same. It's all this going to the same person. So whatever, uh, however you want to get in touch is, is great if you'd like to. Uh, carved out um i think you know um not that this is a circular praise session where we're all praising each other but one beautiful thing about 350 is that a lot of um the teammates that are brought aboard to even just the professional side of what 350 has to do come from grassroots organizing and i think this is what makes it a powerful kind of large network um, you know, it's so centered and rooted in that kind of culture. Um, and, uh, you know, that that differentiates it from some of the larger kind of INGOs that are more historical and have been around and all that kind of thing, and might be, you know, quite powerful and helpful in, in other ways. But one of the great assets of 350 is that organizing culture remains intact. Um, the partners that it's choosing are people that are, you know, really engaged in, 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 in the in the climate justice struggle, including those of you in this room. Um, so it's just really always a privilege to kind of uh, have a chance to to meet you, talk more with you, learn from 